Hey everybody, uh, this is Jackie, and in this lecture we are going to continue chapter 26, focusing on the ways that artists are interacting with their audiences in new and unprecedented ways during the 21st century. And we're going to start by looking at a few examples of artists mining art history for material. We begin with the work of the Japanese artist Yasumasa Muramura. This painting, of course, is not by Muramura, but by the French artist Edouard Manet. Manet, as we have seen, has played an especially prominent role in the progression of modern and contemporary art. You may recall that he riffed off classical paintings in his works, but much to the chagrin of his contemporaries, he took certain measures to make the people in his paintings appear contemporaneous. We are looking at Manet's Olympia, which we know was an updated version of Titian's Venus of Urbino. And here is Portrait by Muramura. Like Manet, the Japanese photographer Muramura placed himself in compositions that had been created by others and associated himself with Cindy Sherman, another artist whose work we have been looking at. This is A Sudden Gust of Wind from 1993 by the Canadian photographer Jeff Wall. This work was inspired by a woodblock print by the artist Kasushika Hokusai. Wall is interested in narrative photography, and his prints are shown as large light boxes that are supposed to mimic the propagandistic quality of history painting. Another way that he references works from the past in his contemporary practice. For context, here is another work by Wall. This one seems to capture a split moment in time, though Wall often combines several images into one composition through a painstaking process. This work, titled The Destroyed Room, presents an untidy scene that seems lush and attractive because of the saturated colors. Despite this mess, a viewer is called to inspect and spend time in this chaos. American artist and Yale grad Matthew Barney often uses his own body to understand and explore artistic intuition with lush and exotic costumes and characters. In his series titled The Cremaster Cycle from 1994 to 2002, Barney explores this theme at length. In the third segment of these video works, Barney is an apprentice who needs to overcome great physical and psychological tests. It is a lengthy metaphor for the struggles of the artist, a story that many of you might be familiar with as well. Barney also enlisted faces that might be recognized by those within the art world to act as key players in this work. Here we are looking at Richard Serra, the American artist known for his large-scale abstract steelworks. Oftentimes, his works were so large that viewers are impressed upon the scale and magnitude of the materials. Perhaps a viewer may even feel a twinge of foreboding when encountering a Sarah sculpture in the wild. Originally from California, Raymond Pettibon now lives and works in New York City. Initially, he made illustrations that were aimed at young people in California, making posters for bands for SST Records. Black Flag and Sonic Youth were some of the bands whose posters Pettibon had designed. As he moved away from commercial art, Pettibon continued working in his painterly, illustrative style, as we see in this pen and ink work on paper. Other works retain the sense of immediacy that characterized Pettibon's fresh work. Charles Ray uses the human figure to explore idealism and reality with immaculate craftsmanship. In Ray's works, the hyperreal meets the fake or contrived. This is Family Romance from 1993. At first glance, it's clear that something is awry. The parents are actually scaled down 50% and the children are scaled up by the same measure. This is Men's Suits from 2009 by the artist Charles Ladre. Here we are looking at what appears to be an ordinary space of commerce that has likewise been shrunk. The jackets are approximately three inches across. It's interesting to note that Ladre is self-trained. 
He makes everything himself without any studio assistance, unlike many contemporary artists who work with sometimes rather large teams of assistants, fabricators, and facilitators. In a similar vein, the video and performance artist Guy Benair transformed his own Tel Aviv kitchen into a set for an abridged version of Moby Dick. The film stars himself, friends, and family members. In these stills, you see glimpses of an ordinary kitchen, an ordinary drama, and ordinary people enacting the drama of the text. Sometimes it even appears a little goofy. In another work by the artist called Steel and Beauty from 2007, the artist and his family lived in IKEA rooms at stores around the world. They would eat, bathe, and even argue in these fabricated spaces before being thrown out by security guards, which usually happen within minutes. Artist Christian Marclay made a habit of frequenting thrift stores in search of materials to make his installations, sound pieces, and films. This work, 2,822 records from 1987 to 2009, consists of 12-inch vinyl records that fill the floor of the gallery space. The Clock, from 2010, was a 24-hour piece made from film footage of clocks. Remarkably, the time of the clocks on the screen were synchronized to the actual time in real life for viewers. Kara Walker attended the Rhode Island School of Design and moved to New York City after a very successful show at the Drawing Center. She currently teaches at Columbia University, and her work probes the narrative of race and slavery in American history, often with decorative flourishes reminiscent of certain traditions such as silhouette portraits. These black paper-cut portraits were popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. Her work led her to the conviction that American identity, both black and white, takes pleasure in the brut brutal realities of racism. Nearly 35 feet tall, this giant sculpture called A Subtlety, or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, was made inside the historic Domino Sugar Refinery in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, by the American contemporary artist Kara Walker. With the body of a cat, the giant bust fabricated from white sugar recalls the racist stereotype of a black woman. The deeper context for this site-specific work explores the connection between sugar and the transatlantic slave trade. Enslaved Africans were brought to this country to satisfy the desire for sugar. This work was made for this location, breathing temporary life into the former factory space before it was demolished to make way for a public park. Russian-born artists Vitaly Komar and Alexander Melamid mine the history of art as well, but they are specifically interested in the history of taste. In the United States, they developed a series of works based on Americans on what Americans liked and disliked in art called the Most Wanted Painting Series. Most Wanted Dishwasher Size from 1994, as we see here, is a painting of a landscape that is sized as the title suggests. These findings were based on surveys, merging populism and irony together. Let's turn our attention now to artists grappling with the notions of childhood and identity in their work. American photographer Sally Mann often worked with her own children as the subject of her photographs. This choice was the source of scrutiny because some of the photos of her children in the immediate family portfolio of prints were not completely clothed. Regardless, her, image, her images are highly composed, though they can feel sometimes spontaneous. In this piece, called The New Mothers from 1989, Mann's two daughters are playing motherhood. It si simultaneously shows the pressure women receive to be nurturing and sexy. During the 17th century, at least, young women and children, or since the 17th century, at least, young women and children have been depicted playing mothers or other similarly nurturing roles within society. Here's another work by Mann exploring parallel themes of innocence, childhood, and sexuality. And here is a work from the series What Remains. The title gives away the meaning of this work. Another photographer 
Rinika Dijkstra, makes portraits and explores adolescence, looking for subjects who fail to, quote, have everything under control, end quote. One series showed people at beaches around the world, as we see here in this image from Coney Island. Another series documented kids at nightclubs. They were often photographed in the coat room of the venue, as we see in this photo, The Buzz Club from Liverpool, England. Born in South Africa under the apartheid, Marlene Dumas has spoken of her awareness of her self-image as a, quote, sweet young girl, unquote. The painter from 1994 seems to be a family snapshot. There's a little kid with dirty hands, but some have likened this image to a crime scene. There are often very dark undertones in Dumas' works, and in this painting, death, innocence, and childhood are combined. Here's an installation shot of her work at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles in 2008. Taken as a whole, these inky portraits are both perverse and ominous. British artist Tracy Emin blends her private and public persona into one. Her work often portrays her as a rash teenager, as we see in this installation of My Bed. Emin was nominated for the Turner Prize and displayed her bed for the occasion. But when she did not receive the award, she stormed off the stage drunk. This work by Emin appears to be a simple tent, perhaps a normal tent, but a closer look at the interior gives the work a much different meaning. The title of the work is Everyone I Have Ever Slept With from 1963 to 1995, which gives new meaning to the names stitched inside the tent. The following artists incorporate their own biographies into their works. Carrie Mae Weems works across different media such as text, fabric, and painting, but is best known for her photographs. Weems studied folklore at the University of California at Berkeley, and her works are often imbued with a narrative quality. Untitled Kitchen Table shows various aspects of married and domestic life for two educated working class African Americans. These images are accompanied by text narrated through different voices about home life. Weems received the MacArthur Grant in 2013, among many other prestigious awards. Glenn Ligon uses text and quotations from various sources, such as James Baldwin and Mary Shelley. His works most often explore and probe his experiences being an African American in the United States. Untitled, I Feel Most Colored When I Am Thrown Against a Sharp White Background from 1990 to 1991 becomes a textual abstraction similar to a Jasper Johns painting. It also shows Ligon's understanding of race in America. The text becomes blurry and illegible towards the bottom of the composition. Lorna Simpson fuses conceptual art and pictorial conventions to talk about race in America as well. Guarded Conditions from 1989 addresses racially and sexually directed violence. Here, the backsides of female figures become a stand-in for social oppression. Describing her book, The Other Side, artist Nan Golden said, The pictures in this book are not about people suffering gender dysphoria, but rather expressing gender euphoria. This book is about new possibilities and transcendence, as we see here and again here. In addition to presenting a progressive view of gender expression, Golden touches on other heavy subjects. During the late 80s, Golden was heavily addicted to drugs and she documented her abuse and eventual recovery. Drawing on more universal themes tied to humanity, William Kentridge makes animations and will often show the drawings he uses to make the animations alongside the films themselves. He thinks of all his work as about the city in one way or another. There are biographical influences of his experiences as a white South African living through the end of the apartheid. Now we are going to take a look at a few ways artists are thinking about making abstract work at this time. 
Visually engaging and oddly cool, Jonathan Lasker's works express his relationship with abstract expressionist paintings, but from a safe distance. He understands the limits of this movement, but he also retains hope in the ability of painting to be expressive and powerful. In particular, Lasker is influenced by Bruce Martin's calligraphic paintings, but he didn't like how quickly a viewer went from looking at the painting to having deep thoughts. His process is postmodern. He makes gestural drawings, which are copied and blown up on a larger scale in his paintings. These copied marks become the individual marks within a painting, like a specific painting language. He calls this process, quote, editing my own subconscious. In the painting, To Believe in Food from 1991, the impulses to edit and misrepresent in painting and in can and in contemporary life are present. Ronnie Horn had a retrospective that was titled Making Being Here Enough, and this work speaks to the artist's desire to, quote, make sensible experience more present, end quote. In When Dickinson Shut Her Eyes from 1993, the work we are looking at, a viewer understands and can read the poetry on these sculptures only by moving around them and investigating the forms, appealing to a viewer's physical senses. The canvases of Fiona Ray are a mixture of abstraction and representation. There are references to the grid of minimalist painters and more expressive painting marks used like motifs. Like other abstract artists at this time, Ray is pulling both high and low references. Untitled Sky Shout from 1997 is a collage of different types of brushstrokes from the history of art. Smears, circles, palette knife markings, and brushes, as well as other materials can be seen. Ellen Gallagher is interested in the idea of using abstraction as a code in her work. For example, in They Could Still Serve from 2000, Gallagher uses the eyes from caricatures of African Americans. Describing her process, she talked about, quote, a willingness to play with something that is ugly, making a cosmology out of these things that are so awful, end quote. These types of hidden meanings and references are not often accessible for today's viewers, which suggests a different meaning on race in our contemporary times. That's it for this lecture, everyone. Thanks very much for watching, and don't forget about the quiz on Canvas. See you soon.